Hello, everyone. Welcome to this online workshop, um, Best Practices for Documenting Social Science uh, Research Data. Uh, my name is Maureen Haker, and um, I have been working with the UK Data Service for over 10 years now. Um, I'm a qualitative specialist, um, but I've worked on everything from ingesting collections through reuse projects. Um, and today we're going to be focusing specifically on documenting um, all types of research projects, including um, quantitative and qualitative projects. So without further ado, um, we're going to move forward. So what we're, what we're going to do today is I'm going to do a bit of talking. There are a couple of exercises, and we are actually going to start uh, with an exercise um, and I will try and, and keep an eye on that Q and box, Q and A box as we go along. Okay, so this gives you, if we can move on, this gives you an overview of what we're going to do today. Um, so we've we'll start with the basics. What is documentation and why it why it's important? Um, and for that, we've got an exercise to help illustrate that. We've got some discussion of the fair principles as well, and from there we'll move on to metadata or data about data, uh, which is really what documentation is at its core. We'll then move on to some examples of data level documentation, um, then study level documentation, um, with a distinction between common documentation for qualitative projects and documentation for quantitative projects. So throughout, again, we do have a couple of, of things to try and make it a little bit more interactive, um, but hopefully by the end of it, you should know what kind of docu documentation you can collect from your project um, and what you should include if you're going to be depositing um, data with us. So first thing that we're gonna do is get started with a practical activity. And this is to try and, um, uh, you know, stress what the importance of documentation is. So Emma, my colleague who is here facilitating with me is going to hopefully pop a link in the chat box to uh, um, uh, a worksheet. And on that, you'll find an interview extract. I want you to read through the interview extract and try and guess what is the participant's age and what year was the interview conducted? Um, so you'll notice a few things as soon as you start trying to read this interview extract. Um, but keep in mind, I want you to try and guess what is the participant's age and what year did the interview take place? Okay, so I'll give you, I mean, you'll need a few minutes to try and get through. It's a short interview extract, but um, it's a little bit of a more difficult read, I think. So um, I'll give you uh, about 10 minutes to have a look at this. Um, and see what guesses that you have, okay? Hopefully everyone can access the worksheet, but if you do have any issues, do just pop it in the chat um, and we'll try and help with that. For those that have just joined, we're just doing a bit of an activity now, um, reading through an interview extract and trying to guess the participant's age and the year the interview took place. The link to that um, is in the chat. Um, which hopefully you can access. Oh, we've got guesses coming in now. Okay, so seems like a lot of people are kind of looking from like the 70, 80. I think we've got a couple of people saying about 60 years old. Um, some people have gone and checked the user guide, which is a bit cheaty, um, but that's all right. That's the whole point of why the user guide is there. And we've got a lot of guesses on the year everything from, let's see, the 90s, the 2000s. Um, yeah, somebody recognizes the Glaswegian um, kind of Scottish accent, thick Scottish accent in this, um, what we call verbatim transcription, um, where they've done it phonetically, which makes it, I think, a bit of a hard read, doesn't it? Um, got somebody guessed the 1980s. Excellent. All right. So um, if I, Emma, if you could um, pop in the, the second uh, worksheet now. Thank you. Fantastic. So I'm going to, I'm going to reveal the answers now. Um, so we've got uh, the documentation available with it. Um, so there's a second worksheet here that Emma has just popped the link into. So the, um, 
age of our participant is 43 and the date of her interview was 1978. Um, so this is, I think, a, a really interesting bit of um, interview, which is um, exploring health um, in a previous generation. And the G does stand for grandmother. So I know some of you might have been, uh, this is grandmother 19, some of you might have been possibly thinking of your own grandparents. I certainly would have if I didn't see the documentation for this particular collection. Um, and I think automatically you contextualize it to your own experiences. And yes, 43 is a very young grandmother, isn't it? Um, that's kind of crazy to think about. That's that's not a whole lot older than uh, me, to be honest. And I can't imagine I have a five year old daughter, let alone another generation following. Um, so it is very young. Um, but the point of this exercise has a, another purpose, and it's to start thinking about well, why why do we uh, collect this documentation? Why do we make it available? And certainly, we might be able to see the purpose if you're uh, reusing data and you're approaching it um, from an outside perspective, knowing that this grandmother is quite young, perhaps knowing what region she came from, somebody pointed out um, the Scottish background there um, is actually really important, especially if you're talking about something like with the um, with parenting styles or having that additional context is really important. But even something as basic that the year that the interview was taken, um, some of the, the things mentioned here, knowing that it's late 70s versus 2010s versus, you know, last year, I think kind of shows you something about how ideas change over time um, and where we expect some certain trends to happen. Um, so hopefully this has you thinking about that actually this information is important, not just to help contextualize data that's been deposited that might be reused by others, but actually even just to contextualize your own research. Really important to be thinking about um, uh, what kind of information is needed and how you take that into account. So we're going to move on from here and actually get into some of the nitty gritty. <laughs> I want to um, just back up briefly to talk about the idea uh, that uh, about the types of documentation that we're going to be covering. So um, when I was doing the agenda, I mentioned data level and study level, um, which is also called project level documentation. Um, and these are the terms that we use at the UK Data Service. Um, data level documentation provides information about the data objects. Um, so this could be variable information in a data file or some demographic details of a participant in an interview transcript. So for example, the age of the uh, participant there would be data level documentation. Study level documentation is information about the broader research project. So what methods were used, the summaries uh, 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 of any findings, um, it would be, for example, the year that the uh, research took place. Um, which was the second thing I had you guessing in that activity. So that's an example of a study level documentation. These aren't the only terms, however, that have been used to describe documentation. All this material from your research is called different things by different policies in different places. So archives like the UK Data Service, um, we'll call it documentation. And under documentation, we have very specific kinds of documentation. So we have user guides, and somebody mentioned in the comments that they went to the user guide, which is, of course, the thing that you should do when you approach new data. Um, so, uh, you know, we have user guides, we have data lists. We have data dictionaries, um, and I'm going to talk about all of those in, in this workshop. But there's also things like the README files, um, which you may have been asked to write for us if you've ever deposited data with us. Some policies, like the ESRC's data policy, refers to research materials, which doesn't really have a specific definition as such, but rather it kind of refers to anything that might have been used across the research project. It also refers to data assets, which is the system that is used to hold the data. 
And there's also metadata and the specific kind of brand name, if you like, of metadata, which is DDI. So DDI is a specific schema of metadata that gives you a distinct vocabulary to use when describing data. So I'm going to talk about metadata a little bit more. Um, so while the concept of documentation is quite simple, the deeper you go, the deeper those ideas begin to run. So if you're interested in exploring some more of the terminology, Codata has a working group that's dedicated to the terminology and guidance on terminology. Um, hopefully some of the practical examples uh, that I'm going to go through of the different types of documentation will give you enough of a flavor to really dive into any area that you want to know a bit more about. So now you know what it is, the different levels, and are hopefully starting to see how embedded these are to doing and disseminating research. Why do we do it? Um, documentation from the point of an archive maximizes the reuse value of our collections, and it's also essential for us to review and publish the data. You can't understand data without documentation. If you just dropped an interview transcript in the middle of the street, for example, and someone picked it up, they can't really understand the data um, without understanding the context in which it was gathered. And that was the whole point of, of this exercise, is to kind of demonstrate this particular point. This also adds to the historical value of the data, and it builds a provenance for it. Documentation allows you to expand on the methods and the processes that might not normally get covered in a publication. So, you know, there's endless space for documentation if you feel it's useful for understanding the data. Um, but meanwhile, you know, journal articles will say that you need this highly sanitized kind of little paragraph about methodology, and that's all you get for describing all of the messiness of methods and analysis. Um, and, you know, diving into some of that a little bit more will also enhance some of your research outputs. So documentation is an output in and of itself, and the documentation itself can be reused. And again, I'll talk about some examples of that later. Um, it also adds a level of transparency to research. So as part of the peer review process, reviewers can better understand your work and the data, and reusers can also more accurately and efficiently reuse that data. And finally, it aids the creation of FAIR data uh, and FAIR research. So I'll talk more about FAIR data in just a moment if it's a new term for you. But first, I wanna do one more exercise that will maybe also highlight for you some of these points, again, on why documentation is important. Um, so this is a little bit more rapid fire, but I want you to imagine for a moment that you're looking at the table here. Can you understand what this data represents? So looking at it, we might be able to guess the meaning of something, uh, of some of these numbers, maybe, but we need a little bit extra information to help us understand and use this data. So we'll go to the next slide. And we've added a little bit of additional metadata here. So all of a sudden this data table is transformed and the usability of it has dramatically increased. However, we are still missing some important pieces of contextual information. So what's missing here? What would help us make sense of this? Um, any suggestions through the chat? Units, excellent. So if we move on here, um, by applying some additional metadata, it gives you further information about the units um, in which the numerical data are presented, and it helps make the data even easier to interpret. Okay, so hopefully this was a clear demonstration of how context can matter um, and also how it can change your perception of the data. But why share documentation and data? Um, this particular point is one of the key underpinning principles of FAIR data. FAIR principles are relatively new guidelines. They have been around for a few years now. I think since 2016 is when they were published. Um, but their guidelines or goals of research, which aim to make research more transparent, more collaborative, and more constructive. 
Um, so since the early 2000s, technology has had a massive impact on how research is done. We can collect more data, which is more complex, and we can share it much quicker than we've ever been able to do before. However, despite collecting so much data all the time, we still have challenges to processing that data. So just think about any organization where data is not shared between departments. I'm sure many of you have personal experiences um, of this, um, and you have to constantly re-enter the same information. So how do we solve this? Well, in 2016, Wilkinson et al. published the FAIR principles, which outlined what good data management looked like um, that would enable the sharing and reuse of data. The key here behind the FAIR principles is to make the data machine readable, to, um, uh, you know, to use technology that has so massively changed the way research is done um, and make that data something that you can share easily and can reuse. Uh, so the guidelines were so influential that an international collaboration established the Go Fair International Support and Coordination Office just a year after they were published. Um, these FAIR principles continue to influence policies as well. So you'll see FAIR references in data policies of the Research Data Alliance, um, the Association of European Research Libraries, um, UKRI and all of its research councils also refer to FAIR data. And if you receive any grant or taxpayer money to complete your research, chances are you're going to be asked to share the data and documentation at the completion of the project. Um, many publishers are now also requiring the sharing of data and research materials before publication, and it's all done in the name of transparency and research rigor. So off the top of my head, I can think of, for example, the Cambridge um, journals, all of them will require you to uh, share your data at least at the point of peer review process, if not actually provide some sort of um, link or DOI to the data deposited somewhere. And the FAIR principles state that the data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, research is not just something that you can, you know, that you complete in the solitude of your academic office, um, but it's something that's completed in collaboration with others. And then ideally it's shared for further reuse. So to make your data fair, you, it also means documenting that data. To make the data findable and accessible requires you to have clear metadata. Equally, to make the data reusable means documenting the provenance of that data. I won't go into uh, the FAIR principles here in detail, but please do send any questions that you might have about it through the q and I'm happy to try and give more detail if you're interested um, in knowing a bit more about FAIR data. Um, however, I did want to point something out um, which spans across the FAIR principles, and that is metadata. So metadata is really at the root of what documentation is. It helps to describe the data in catalog pages. It helps to describe participants, and it helps to describe the methods. There's a lot of grassroots work uh, that's being done to build up what we call schemas of metadata to try and synchronize some of those descriptions. So we're going to expand a little bit more on metadata and introduce you to DDI. So metadata, we'll cover what it is, what qualifies as good metadata, what some of the standards are, and how it's produced. So we're starting here with metadata because all documentation is, in a sense, metadata. But what is metadata? The best definition of metadata that I've heard is that it's data about data. Essentially, it's information that describes and explains data. So usually when we talk about metadata, we're talking about standardized, structured information. The idea behind the standardization is that it will be machine readable. So if you go to our data catalog and start searching for data, our catalog is reading the standardized metadata on the catalog pages to bring back results because metadata is what is underpinning the cataloging, 
our citing and discovering and retrieving of uh, data collections. So basically, you need metadata in order to find data collections. So good, complete metadata becomes very important for the reuse of data. Importantly, metadata should be collected and recorded throughout the research data lifecycle. It's not simply something you should think about as you're depositing a data set or looking at reusing a data set. Instead, you should be thinking about it at each step of creating, preserving, and reusing data thinking about what metadata is available and what metadata might enhance that collection. But what does metadata actually depict? All of this metadata um, aims to answer the journalistic sort of five W's and one H of data. Who created the data? What does the data file contain? When, uh, when were the data created? Where were the data created? You know, why weren't, you know, why was the data created to begin with? Um, and how was that data uh, created? So we have lots of examples of how this is done. Overall, the key question is, what would someone with no prior knowledge of the project or of the data need to be able to understand and use that data correctly in their own research? Some of the metadata that we capture uh, on the UK Data Service catalog pages includes these fields listed here. So an abstract, a set of keywords and topics, um, which in our catalog are based on a standardized schema. So you search and select from a list of keywords and topics, um, the dates of, of field work, uh, country information about the sample, including um, observation and analytic units, population, the number in your sample. Um, there's also information collected about the methods and the kind of data um, and weighting where that is applicable. We are collecting this information or tacitly might know this information about our own research. Why have you said that it needs to be structured? So structured metadata or metadata that is standardized and uses a schema to guide its description. Um, so by using structured metadata, it helps to establish how one piece of information relates to other pieces of information and makes it easier for computers to automatically extract information from that metadata. This is obviously helpful for archives who are looking to increase findability for data collections, but it's also useful um, to see how your research fits in with the larger field. It helps you to kind of find background literature or data to help build up the context for your research questions. And this information provides context that might influence the decisions um, that you make in analysis. So what are metadata standards? Um, who decided what these are? A metadata standard provides a framework to establish a common set of characteristics or attributes of data. These are very standardized in the sense of, you know, from the language that they use, from the spelling of the words, um, and even the format uh, that it comes in. All of this is taken into account when setting the standards. If everyone uses a different standard, it makes it very difficult to find um, or compare data from different sources. A metadata standard is a requirement which is intended to establish a common understanding of the meaning or the semantics of the data to ensure correct and proper use and interpretation of that data by its owners and by users. But there are different standards that are set um, and those are often based on disciplinary differences. So consequently, sometimes it's necessary for a translation program to map between these standards, and that allows for you know, better findability. So metadata standards allow for data discovery and access, um, consequent reuse of the data, interoperability of systems. So being able to use data across different systems and programs um, and sharing of data and metadata between communities, be those communities, you know, data providers like archives or data users or, you know, different types of data users. And there are a, a number of metadata schemas that can be used. However, for those who are doing research in social sciences, 
DDI is the schema to understand best. Um, and it's also what the UK Data Service uses to underpin the data catalog. So DDI, or the Data Documentation Initiative, is a rich and detailed metadata standard which has been de uh, developed by the DDI Alliance. So there's a couple different versions of DDI. The DDI Codebook and the DDI Lifecycle. DDI Codebook gathers more basic uh, information, and it's often used to describe collections at a higher level. So it's really useful for data catalogs. DDI Lifecycle, on the other hand, is a little bit more complex and allows you to also describe survey questions and variables um, in addition to you know, some of those basic catalog information. DDI lifecycle might be particularly useful if you're looking at longitudinal studies where similar questions or variables might be reused across different survey waves. It allows for you to be able to identify and compare responses across the same variables. So just to point out here, there's a lot of different types of metadata standards and schemas, and some have very specific uses. So you can use more than one standard to help you describe the data. And you may also be able to map or translate across uh, different standards. So this just gives you a, a screenshot, a rolling screenshot of what one of our catalog pages looks like. And you can see all of this information that is really quite structured, especially when we talk about like the methodology, for example, um, a lot of those those uh, fields are standardized to a very specific idea, uh, very specific language, um, very specific way of, of um, recording, for example, the years of, of field work, that sort of thing. Um, so if you look across any of our catalog pages, they will all use the DDI lifecycle um, metadata standard, and, um, and they will all use similar kinds of language it is worth considering um, how to describe and share your metadata as openly as possible. So using the FAIR principles can help with that and with other tools such as metadata profiles. Um, those are all available to help you decide on you know, the important metadata elements to include when describing your study. In addition to the DDI structure of the metadata for our catalog pages, we also subscribe to controlled vocabularies. So you'll notice on the catalog pages, we also have topics and keywords that you can use um, to search for related data. These are not just free text fields. These are from controlled vocabularies. The UK Data Archive is the guardian of the humanities and social sciences electronic thesaurus um, and multilingual version, uh, the European language social science thesaurus. So there are a number of these vocabularies, which are usually, again, discipline specific. So our next bit is going to give you a bit of an opportunity to search through the different uh, controlled vocabularies. So uh, what I'd like you to do now is to go to bartok.org um, and search for voc uh, controlled vocabularies of your discipline. Um, so if you go ahead um, and just type in um, that URL and you'll see that there's a search bar, you can just start searching for your discipline and see what sorts of things come up. Or you might um, be interested to know if there's a controlled vocabulary for your specific area of research. So it might be a little bit not just the discipline, but more, a little bit more thematic. Um, and see what sorts of things come up. So I'm just gonna give you a couple of minutes here just to have an explore and see what kinds of controlled vocabulary um, pop up. Okay, I'm gonna leave you with that. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna move on from there. So hopefully you've been able to have a bit of an explore, see what's out there in terms of the controlled vocabularies. Um, but now we're gonna switch gears and talk a little bit more about data level documentation. Um, so I'll give you a quick explanation again of, of data level documentation. And then we've got some considerations for survey type data and for qualitative data. So data level documentation is all about the specific data files within your collection. This relates not to the whole collection, 
but it, to very specific data files, which could be, for example, a single interview transcript, an SPSS file, or a single image. Um, often this kind of metadata is embedded in the file, and sometimes you collect this information as a standard part of the data collection. So in survey data, um, data level documentation tends to be a very structured, and if you're if you're using a program like SPSS, the software is designed for you to add that metadata before you even begin the analysis. So this net metadata becomes embedded um, within the data itself. So for variable names, there needs to be a question number system which matches the questions in the questionnaire, or if there's a numerical system that's used, um, it should be clear what the system is used uh, and, and how it relates to the questionnaire and um, the different variable names that are used. Um, so we should have meaningful abbreviations such as, you know, GOR for government office region. Um, there should be a consistency in the naming conventions across the entire project, especially where there are different data sets across the project. Um, and finally, for interoperability across platforms, variables should not be longer than eight characters and should be without spaces, okay? Um, so some platforms don't like longer names or spaces being used. Following the similar principle for variable names, the variable labels should be brief and concise, so no more than 80 characters. Where applicable, they should um, use a unit of measurement. So we saw that with the previous, with one of the previous exercises. And again, if applicable, describe the coding or classification scheme that's used, including a reference. So for example, the standard occupational classification 2000, SOC 2000, um, is, is, uh, is the reference for what's used there for that variable. Finally, um, include a reference to the question in the survey or the questionnaire. Um, the example here does all of the above. Uh, so Q9BHEXW is given for the label, uh, is given the label Q9B in hours um, spent talking to physical exercise in a typical week. Um, so the label clearly includes the unit of measurement, um, a reference uh, to the question as well. Um, so not only does this make it easier for reusers, but I expect it makes it easier during the analysis as well. And you should add value labels as well, making sure that there are no out of bounds values for categorical variables. So avoid having blanks or zeros and instead label your missing data um, with detail where possible, differentiating between potentially, you know, not recorded, not provided, not applicable, not known. Um, there's a lot of different reasons for missing values. So getting a little bit more nuance there is always helpful. And here we have an example of an SPSS variable view, which shows the variable name. You can see the label here, as well as the measurement and the missing values. And here are the variable values, which you know includes missing information. With transcripts, data level documentation is usually included at the start of each interview, certainly um, for any interviews that we've curated within the UK Data Service. Um, so you'll see a kind of standardized template that's used um, when we have a hand in the curation there. So we tend to use the collection name, the principal investigator name, um, plus demographic details about the participant, including, for example, uh, their sex, their socioeconomic status, and the region. These details can vary depending on what characteristics are deemed important or influential to the study. So they might not always necessarily, you know, not every interview is necessarily going to look the same, but um, we do have this additional metadata that we tend to provide um, with each interview. Um, images similarly will have some metadata about the image itself. Now we don't have many collections with images. Um, there are some lingering issues like anonymization to deal with, which impacts the usefulness of uh, an image. However, we do have some examples, including images with, for example, our Edwardians collection, 
Um, and in these, we've included a caption which describes the photo itself, including anything that is notable about the image. You might also want to include some historical notes to help contextualize the image. And you can also record characteristics like region, the year it was taken, who it was taken by. All of this would be quite useful metadata to help make sense of the image at a later date. Okay, so that's data level documentation. I'm gonna switch again now to talk about study level documentation or project level documentation. And that provides quite high level information on the research context and design, uh, the data collection methods that were used, any data preparations and manipulations, um, plus summaries of findings that are based on the data. All of this kind of gets included under the umbrella of project level documentation. User guides are a key piece of documentation that sits alongside data collections and includes further information about the methods, the field work. It includes all of this information together um, and it's usually made openly available. So you don't need to register with the UK data, data service in order to view it. Um, looking at the user guide alone, you probably would be able to start unpicking the intricacies of the collection. So that's the whole point. You can get to know the collection um, before having to download it. So rather than being embedded with the data, um, you know, like the previous examples of data level documentation, user guides would be provided as a separate document that is openly available. And user guides do look different across collections. There's no specific template as such, but rather it's tailored to what information is available and what the specifics are of the collection. Um, I won't go through the three that are listed here, but do feel free to have an explore of the user guides. Um, so we just linked on here three of them to, that you can have a look at if you're interested in seeing some examples of three very different kinds of user guides. But I am going to show you a few um, uh, just kind of snapshots. Uh, just to give you a taste for what they're like. So within the collections that are curated by the UK Data Archive, these materials would be collated into a single PDF file. The user guide is then bookmarked. So you can see it on the um, right side of the screen, of the screenshot there, the bookmarks tell you what materials are, are available within that user guide. These tend to encompass all of the projects level documentation, all of it would go into the user guide. So while collections curated by the UK Data Archive would have this as a single user guide, you're more likely to see a folder of documents or separate files on collections that are deposited by researchers themselves through our system called ReShare. So this user guide you see here is an example of a survey. Um, and, you know, those bookmarks basically act as a map to talk you through the preparation and delivery of the survey, as well as any other information that you might need to know. Um, so there's further information in this user guide about the sample, about the questionnaire, about the data structure, and there's even a bit on how to cite the user guide um, as well. In addition to what you saw in that example, other key documentation for surveys would include things like technical reports, information leaflets and protocols, blank questionnaires with code books and survey instructions, coding frames, um, and any information about known errors or issues with the data. Qualitative collections also have user guides like the one that you see here. This time the bookmarks are on the left hand side. So this one shows an interview topic guide along with a final report that was done for the project and a blank consent form. And then again, there's more information about the sample in this user guide. And here's another list of some examples of documentation for qualitative work. And basically, it's all the information that you probably create along the way of doing the research, but it is never usually seen outside the research team or maybe just, you know, not seen by anyone other than participants. So this can include interview preparation, including instructions to interviewers, prompts or topic guides, um, blank consent forms, information sheets, or any other materials that the participant received prior uh, to taking part in the project. 
It could also be text written by you that is expanding on the methodology or sampling, including where it's permissible under copyright extracts of publications or draft work. What we don't often uh, see, but it can be really useful, is things like research meeting minutes, um, research diaries or field notes, or documentation from the analysis, including things like memos or code books or just your initial analysis write-ups, like a draft piece of draft work. In the 1500 collections or so of qualitative uh, research, um, we don't see many things that include information on analysis specifically. And I'm not sure why it's not typically included as part of the documentation, um, because that is something that's pretty standard in quantitative collections. So they will provide code or syntax in quantitative collections and clearly outline um, kind of what their analysis steps were. Um, but that kind of analytical transparency, I think, really helps to validate research findings, and it can really help reusers better understand some of the decisions that were made, or perhaps not made, about the cleaning and processing of the data. And this kind of context is actually really, really important to qualitative work. This is part of what the argument is for doing things qualitatively, so that you have that contextual information that you're kind of building into your analysis and, and how you do your um, research. Um, you know, the idea is that the better you understand that context, um, and hopefully all those materials are being actively considered by the research team during the data collection and analysis, um, the more valid and accurate uh, your research findings are. So collating them and making them available as documentation, I think really helps achieve what qualitative work is aiming to achieve. Um, but for some reason, we don't we don't often get some of these these later ones, um, those last uh, you know three or four um, listed here. But you can include those in documentation if you want. So I said that, um, you know, if it if it's something that is being deposited by a um, researcher themselves, rather than being collated as a single document of a user guide, sometimes that documentation will remain separated into different documents. So this is an example of one of those where they've got a blank questionnaire, an end of award report, the focus group resources, consent form participant information sheet, so on and so forth. And all of those is a, is a separate file. Um, as an alternative to embedded um, metadata, you can also have this information in a structured document altogether. So something like a code book or a data dictionary. Um, and this should contain detailed and sufficient information about all of the data items, including variables uh, that are either new or derived, frequencies, command files used to create those derived variables. We also have codebook creation tools. So we have the DDI editor, which is aimed at data processing for curation purposes. So this can be used prior to depositing your collection in the archive. And we also have a Neststar publisher. Um, so there is a lot of existing information on these and how they can be used. So please do check out um, some of the links there for further information about any of those tools. And just now, um, having a, a little bit of a closer look at code books, you can see this one from Understanding Society Teaching Dataset. And you can see here the variable name, label, and where applicable options for responses um, or the, the range of responses. Unlike embedded metadata that was shown earlier with the um, data level documentation, this code book can sit separately and can um, uh, be open as well. So you can include this kind of thing as part of your project level or study level documentation if you want to. Data dictionaries, um, again, very similar to code books and often those terms, you know, data dictionary and code book are used interchangeably. Those can also sit with study level documentation. So often the data dictionary um, will contain a little bit more information about the structure of the database. So you can see here they've documented the variable um, as numeric and, and scale level measurements. 
In addition to the user guide, the UK Data Archive also curates a data list, which is sort of this at a glance look at participants. Um, this would probably be considered more, well, it might be considered a little bit more data level documentation where you have like basic metadata, basic demographic details about each of the participants and the file name where you can find the relevant data. Um, the details on these data lists are not, do not have to be standardized or all encompassing. It's the details that were relevant to the project itself, but where possible, we encourage people to use um, standardized metadata uh, schemes for, to describe this, this kind of um, uh, documentation. These can take a little bit of time to assemble, but they're really useful organizational tools during research. So it's a really good practice to kind of create one as you go along. Um, so we see these data lists with qualitative collections um, more often. There are other types of documentation as well. Um, this can include things like observations that were written by researchers in the moment of data gathering. Some types of uh, methods actually dictate taking time for self-reflection as part of the method. And this may be um, used as data as well. So there's a little bit of a gray space here in terms of where it sits. Is it data or is it documentation? Um, but often this is just recommended as a good practice um, to do this kind of reflection. So these comments that you see here are just a few sentences that were written after um, an interview, a, a semi-structured interview that was embedded within a survey that was conducted face-to-face. -face. Um, and these were written by the interviewers of Affluent Worker, um, which was the research, the seminal piece of research that was used to create our ONS categories of class. Um, so they help to contextualize the relationships between the researcher and the participant. And it's really helpful data level documentation. Now, this is a little bit unusual. Um, I'm not sure in the sense that we don't, again, don't often see a lot of projects with these kinds of field notes included with them. So I'm not sure if it's that the methods people are using tend to, you know, don't often dictate this kind of quick reflection or if it's just something that people don't feel comfortable sharing, but it really does help to rebuild the power dynamics of an interview um, or basically how the data collection went. Um, so they can be really useful to include. And as they do kind of sit in this gray space between data and documentation, if it was something that you wanted to include but didn't want it openly available, as it would normally be if it was included with the documentation of a collection. You can um, sit it, seat it within the, uh, alongside the data and keep it safeguarded as well um, if you wanted to. A step further from field notes are things like the draft work of analyses. So I mentioned that there's not a lot of examples of this sort of thing. But there is a few, and this one is from Den Dennis Marsden's uh, research, Mothers Alone. Um, so this piece he wrote on felt poverty never actually made it to publication. This was just an initial analysis that he was writing up as he was preparing to write up his book. Um, but it is included in the documentation for this collection. And it is a really interesting collection. So the research was conducted by white educated men who were interviewing single mothers living on welfare. Um, and I think it was conducted in the seventies. Um, but this piece that he included in the documentation really helps to provide context to show how the researchers felt a kind of sympathy toward their participants and really sought to understand how they viewed everyday life. Um, so I think it's really quite revealing um, because initially I think just from the look of the project, you might think that there were um, potentially some issues understanding participants, but this really helps to kind of um, contextualize some of that understanding. Oops, gone too far. Um, so Annette Lawson's study, um, Adultery, an Analysis of Love and Betrayal, um, another project that was conducted a few decades ago, this was in the 1980s, and it was aiming to explore the extremely taboo topic 
at the time anyway, of um, adultery. So as such, it was really hard for her to recruit participants. So Lawson chose to put out a call for participants in a newspaper, but it created an arguably biased sample of mostly white, middle-class women um, who were responding to her call for participants. So as such, Lawson became a bit preoccupied with her sample, and she wrote a 54-page defense of her sample. So she starts here with a discussion on some of the ethical conundrums that arose um, from the sampling strategy, including jealous partners who were sending in information of their married partners to participate, or another man who was calling in from a psychiatric ward. And she also had extensive comparisons between her sample and the national population, um, exploring what was a significant, you know, where were the significant differences between her sample and the national population, um, and whether or not that that would affect her data. So she said, yes, gender and class, clear differences, but there's a lot of other characteristics where our sample and the national population align quite a bit. And she finally came to some of these really interesting conclusions about sampling strategies more broadly, including the point that sampling needs to match the context of the study and that exploratory studies are benefited from a greater focus on the ability to talk about the topic in detail rather than a focus on who are the participants. Um, so this kind of documentation that she included Again, never made it to publication in other sources. And if you look up some of the articles that she wrote on her study, you get this, again, quite sanitized little paragraph about the sample um, and, and just kind of acknowledging that there was a bias in gender and class. Um, but you go through the documentation that sits alongside her data and you get this 54 page um, exploration of the sample and some of the uh, some of what she learned um, uh, through having this particular sample. So earlier I had an example of interviewer notes, but field notes are another uh, good example of very detailed documentation. So I, I think just like um, uh, some of those interviewer notes, this is something that kind of uh, can occupy this space between data and documentation, and it might be considered data at different times and documentation at different times. Um, bearing in mind that documentation is, again, normally something that's openly available, um, you know, the field notes and other types of reflection, depending on the level of detail in there, may need to be hidden um, behind access restrictions with the data. Um, but again, it's just, we don't see a lot of examples of things like this. Um, uh, there's probably about half a dozen collections with field notes, and almost all of them are ethnographic. Um, so if researchers are taking field notes as they're doing their research, um, they usually don't share those, um, even though, you know, again, it does provide quite a lot of um, extra detail about how the research went. Um, there are new possibilities with changing technology as well. So um, some software applications like Envivo, for example, and other computer-assisted qualitative analysis software allows you to download code books, memos, and mind maps. And Vivo also can collect uh, documentation on surveys. So if you wanted to, it, it's basically a giant organizational tool. So if you wanted to um, collect and collate stuff within Envivo, you can do that as well. Um, here you can see a list of nodes, as, as Envivo calls them. Um, so this is coding for qualitative data um, and all the descriptions that were written about each node. All of this is downloadable. Um, when we received the Edwardians collection, uh, which I had an example of earlier, that contained 453 80 plus page interviews with British residents who were born during the Edwardian period. And it was accompanied with all of this work that was done by hand. So we used to have 16 shelves that were dedicated to holding the coding of those transcripts into key themes. 
Um, so all of the transcripts were written on what's called onion skin paper. And um, they cut out the bits of data that they felt went with a particular code and stapled it to another piece of paper. And then they reorganized all of those and put them into these big binders that were arranged by theme. And of course, now you can do this all using software like Envivo. Um, and most software programs will allow you to export specific elements like your code book um, into either a PDF or an RTF uh, document that you would be able to upload um, with any data. And I know research teams are often using things like blogs and websites as well to keep in touch with participants. They might keep a research blog which updates um, others on their progress or posts information about participants or even sends out calls for participants. So once the project is done, that site can then sit alongside the project as a related resource. Um, so we can link to it. And again, just provides that additional documentation on how the research went um, as, it was, as it was unfolding. We also have more creative documentation too, um, such as this example, which is a photo story. Again, this sort of thing can be potentially classed as either documentation or data, um, but there is scope to be able to use um, video and audio files to accompany your data as well. I have also um, spoken quite recently to some depositors who were quite interested in, in um, the idea of doing an interview with researchers and depositing the transcripts of those interviews um, alongside uh, their data. Um, so there's a lot of possibilities now, I think, when we start involving technology as to how we capture some of this data. And finally, changing technology is not just for how research is done, but also how we archive. So the UK Data Service has created a new tool called QualiBank, which is an online tool for searching, browsing, and citing qualitative data. So as part of that tool, you can search and view qualitative data online. And it also um, uh, allows you to view the linked documentation. So this documentation can relate to the specific data so it's data level documentation or to the collection as a whole. So it would be study level documentation, but it allows for this distinction between project level and data level documentation, and you can easily access all of it um, alongside that data. And finally, in addition to user guides and related resources, we also have the README file. So this file usually contains information about how the data was prepared for ingest into the archive. Within the archive, this file can be automatically generated and then edited. Um, but it's important if you're going to deposit your own data or if you've downloaded a data set and you want to know what how the data has been treated or cleaned before being deposited, make sure you have a look at the readme file, which should explain some of those processing procedures in more detail. Okay, so just a few uh, final remarks here, and then um, I'll have a look and see if we've got any questions um, arising. I did wanna make um, a, a final point about reusing documentation. So often we think about the reuse value of data specifically, but less about how documentation has its own value. So documentation can serve as an inspiration for good practices. So adapting consent forms and information sheets, for example, from things that we already hold and is openly available, rather than trying to write these things up from scratch. So we have literally hundreds of consent forms that are documented within our collections. Um, if not thousands of them uh, documented in our collections. And you can see some snippets here of a few of them explaining what data sharing means. Um, so make sure you, you know, you can always explore these, learn from them, um, and you can always use them uh, if you see them as good research practices. And you can do the same with data collection. So one collection, the foot and mouth disease in North Cumbria, deposited their interview guides, which were then reused by medical students to better understand doctor-patient dynamics and how to conduct interviews um, that are used in, in health settings. So I also refer my dissertation students to find similar interview guides before setting out and making one themselves. Um, to help them see what's important to ask and what's not. 
Um, and I know it's a tradition within quantitative research already to reuse um, existing questions um, from national uh, surveys. It allows you to, to validly uh, kind of compare your sample with a national uh, sample on responses, but you do have to reuse the wording in a very specific way so that you're not introducing some variations in how people can respond. You can also examine how to do research with children in vulnerable groups. So writing up information letters and consent forms for children especially is really difficult, um, but we do have a few collections which provide some really good examples um, of, of how this has been done in the past and how you might go about doing this in your own research. <clears throat> so there is some mandatory documentation um, when you are sharing data with us that we will ask for, um, but always make sure you're checking the repository guidelines and creating whatever necessary documentation files um, you might need. So um, the uh, UK Data Service will, for example, ask you for any documentation on um, your methodology. Um, so often this is consent forms, participant information sheets, um, or data dictionaries. We'll also ask you to create a data list and a readme file um, as part of your deposit. Um, when you're depositing data with us, you're asked to fill in a form, and that form will then feed into the catalog page that is created for your collection. So it's important to fill it in with as much detail as possible because this aids findability. Um, and then of course, where we are asking you to use standardized vocabularies to really have a search through and, and try and select as many words as possible um, and really kind of have a good search of the vocabulary um, so you know what kinds of words that you can use that would match your collection. Again, just aids findability and accessibility of your collection. And also ensure that your data files contain any data level documentation that's needed. Um, especially for our quantitative researchers, you know, make sure that your labels and that sort of thing are, are filled into a good standard um, so that others can understand them. We have lots of tools and templates to kind of help you um, as well with your research. So have a look through some of the um, uh, templates that we've got. Again, so you don't have to kind of re rework um, or, or reinvent the wheel rather. Um, when you're doing your own research, you can use what's what's been put out there before. And we also have even further resources um, on data management as well. Um, so we've got our learning hub on research data management. CESDA, which is the Consortium for European Social Science Data Archives, also has data management expert advice. Um, we also have a... Um, publication, a book, Managing and Sharing Data, the Best Practice for Researchers um, that you can access. Closer have their own um, work on understanding metadata. And then of course, if you're interested a little bit more in those FAIR principles that I mentioned earlier, you can go to the gofair.org um, to read a bit more about that. Um, and if you want it all in one book, um, you can also um, get the second edition of our Managing and Sharing Research Data, which has lots of examples of the things that lurk in our archive um, to help exemplify some of this. And there's a specific chapter in there on documentation as well. We have more upcoming events. We're kind of nearing the end of uh, the term and we tend to release these on a termly basis. But if you are interested in attending some more online workshops or drop-in sessions or any of the conferences, um, please check out our events page where you'd be able to register for any of these events. I think we still have some um, online workshops coming up that focus on specific data types, kind of just what we have within our archive. So in a couple of weeks, for example, I'll be doing one on qualitative uh, collections and, and what kinds of things we have on qualitative and mixed collections. But we also do other research data management type of online workshops. So last week we had one on anonymization. I know there's, there's another one on the ethical and legal um, obligations um, of uh, researchers, et cetera. So do have a look at our events page for more events like this. <clears throat>
And we're also on social media. So do feel free to get connected with us. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook and YouTube, and the recording um, and slides are, are going to be um, available um, as well. So the recording will be on YouTube and the slides will be put up on our events page. And I think that is everything. I think that's all we have time for today. Um, hopefully you have found this useful. And if anybody has follow-up questions, please do feel free to email. Um, and um, if you do have very specific project questions and are looking to deposit it, sounds like a couple of you are in receipt of grants, um, please do uh, get in touch with us about that. We're always um, happy to problem solve with you and find a way forward um, to enable any data sharing. Thank you so much, everyone, and um, yeah.